Today, the title of the sermon is Death Defeated. Death Defeated. Now, the theme is this. Those who are in Christ need not fear death. Those who are in Christ need not fear death. I was preparing this sermon and I was thinking, I cannot remember in the 11 years I've been preaching here, in the 10 years I've been pastor, I can never remember preaching an Easter sermon on death before. Yet this morning, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Death. I mean, doesn't that word just kind of grab your attention? Death. Death. It is my suspicion that most everyone listening to this has heard of death before. And that most of us maybe even have known someone who has died. Death comes in many shapes and sizes. Some die in the womb before even seeing the light of day. Some die as children. And others die in their teen and their college years. Some die as young adults, and the rest die as not young adults, slightly older. I was thinking about this. Sometimes death comes with warning. And at other times, it just sneaks up on us. One minute we're eating at King Cone. <laughs> And the next moment, somebody is standing up here in front of a few people saying, oh, he sure loved his ice cream. He didn't like birds much, but he loved his ice cream. (laughs) For those that don't know the... What's going on there? I'm, I, I love birds if they're outside, but once they get inside, I'm terrified by the little critters. You know, we write songs about death. We tell stories about death. And we make blockbuster Hollywood movies about death. Sometimes we tell somebody, I wish you would die. And as soon as they do die, we say, I wish they were still here. The funeral industry in the United States is roughly 21 billion a year. Two million people a year die on average in the United States. So that works out to $950 a person. That number must be low. And I know it does not include the cost of new suits and ties of flowers, and of all of those buckets of chicken from KFC for the memorial service afterwards. The meal. Now, it used to be said, and those of us that are um, older like I am, it used to be said that there are only two sure things in life, death and taxes. But with roughly one half of the U.S., Families not paying any income tax, it looks like there is only one sure thing in life. And that's death. It's only a sure bet. You want to have a sure bet, bet somebody's going to die. It's a pretty sure bet. I don't think any of the bookmakers in Vegas are going to take it, though. Face it, folks. We're all going to die So I think each one of us ought to ask the question, what is death? Now I I can hear in some of your heads this morning, what did I get myself into this morning? Hey, I came here to hear talk of fuzzy bunnies and baby chickens. Of Easter eggs and chocolate rabbits. I didn't sign up for morbid talk of rotting corpses this morning. You're scaring me, Pastor. I don't want to have nightmares tonight. I can picture, I can hear some of that right now. Yeah, honestly though, the thing is, we cannot talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, about why there is even a resurrection Sunday, why there is an Easter, unless we first address the reality of death that we all face. 
What good is a resurrection if you don't die first? We've got to think about death. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is all about death. It is all about death being defeated, in particular. So what is death? I started thinking about that. How you answer that question, what death is, will expose your worldview very quickly. If you have a biblical worldview, you are going to answer one way. But if you have an unbiblical worldview, you are going to answer another way. If you have an unbiblical worldview, then to you death is just, is just the natural course of events. You're born, you live, you die. And that's all she wrote. And the she being Mother Earth, I presume. Death is not natural, actually. It's a very unnatural event. Death came as the result of sin. It was not ever intended to be. It's a very unnatural event, death. It's not what God intended. Now, those with a Darwinistic unbiblical worldview, add the caveat, and after death, nothing happens. Darwin, with his silly theory, not science of evolution, did nothing more than make life meaningless for those who subscribe to his foolishness. He robbed them of meaning of life. If you're a Darwinist, why bother living, I ask? You're only going to die, turn to dirt, and not remember any of this anyways. Why bother? Now, when I think about those who have and hold to this Darwinistic worldview of death, my thoughts carry me back to the days when I used to speed. And yes, I used to speed. My last ticket, my last ticket was driving my car from California here when I brought it out when we moved here, and it was 90 and a 55. So let me this morning call driving, let me give driving the name life. And let me give the concept of being pulled over by the police officer for speeding the name death. So driving is life, being pulled over is death. Those who speed do so in fear that they might be caught at any moment and killed, let's say ticketed. Ticketed is death. So they drive with one eye on the road in front of them to see what's coming and ahead of them, and then the other eye they have in the rearview mirror looking behind them in case death, a police officer, sneaks up upon them. I was very cross-eyed in those days. The left eye was always looking ahead for cars sitting there, and the right eye was always looking in the rearview mirror. And all the while, those who hold to this, this Darwinistic worldview, this, this worldview that so much represents... Uh, a speeder, all of those that hold to this, they're always concocting in their mind an excuse in case they are caught. <laughs> really? you got to be kidding. I didn't see the sign. I was going that fast? <laughs> My odometer must be broken. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. I'm sorry, officer. All I was doing was looking for a restroom. <laughs> But you know what? Darwinists, if they're honest, they will admit they're trying to cheat death and the judgment that comes afterwards by pleading ignorance. Hey, God, I didn't see the signs. You can let me off the hook, right? Huh? Okay, great. Darwinists and those that hold to that unbiblical worldview live their lives with the plan in mind that one day I will plead ignorance. I will take the fifth when I die and stand before God in judgment. I will plead the fifth. I will say, I didn't see all the signs that you put along the way. Why do I know that? Because the Bible says everyone knows there is a God. 
everyone, the Bible says, knows there is a God. But that there are some who suppress that truth in unrighteousness. At the same time, the fear of death is holding them captive. So from that, I can assess that death actually does frighten the Darwinist within his heart. But that the thought of letting go of his or her sin frightens them all the more. So in their minds, they attempt to suppress God and judgment. Now there's another unbiblical, foolish worldview concerning death, and that is what I call believing in a mulligan. Believing in a mulligan. Around the time that I had my chronic speeding pattern problem, I also was an avid golfer. Now, neither I nor any of my golfing buddies were what you would call good golfers. No Tiger Woods in the group. So we were always asking for mulligans. What is a mulligan? It is a do-over. It is like I just really messed up on the shot, but you know that was the fly over there flipped his little wingy things and it threw me off. So I need a mulligan because I do not want to pay the penalty for that first shot that went wrong I want to have a second chance. A mulligan. Now Darwinists believe that they are able to plead ignorance. And then those who subscribe to the silliness of reincarnation believe that they're going to get a mulligan. The problem is that God says it's appointed that a person dies once and then comes judgment. So there are no after-death mulligans. There is no do-over. Purgatory does not exist. Either you get the shot right off the tee or you live with the penalty down the fairway. It is appointed to every person to die once. And then comes judgment. Now my last, for this morning at least, my, my final unbiblical worldview is the one I'm going to call I'm All Set. I'll discuss this this morning, and it's the worldview most shared by people living in this city, in New England, I think, and in the nation. The I am all set worldview when it comes to death. Until Marilyn and I moved to New England and Chris and Amy, I had never heard the saying, I'm all set. But after hearing it for 14 years now, I'm actually totally sick of it. Would you like another cup of coffee? No, I'm all set. Can I help you carry those bags? No, I'm all set. Do you need directions? No, I'm all set. May I prepare you to die by telling you the good news of Jesus Christ? No, I'm all set. <laughs> How many times, Peter, did we hear that on the streets? I'm all set. Yet the person who has not heard and believed the good news of Jesus Christ, they are not all set when it comes to dying. What they believe is this. I'm all set because I'm a good person. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven because God knows my heart. That's what they're saying when they say I'm all set when you ask them things about death. The truth of the matter is, and some people are going to get really upset at me right now, so tough. Um, the truth of the matter is, yes, it is true. If you are a good person, God will let you in heaven. If you do good works, you can get in heaven if you are a good person. Jesus himself said that. Let's listen to Jesus in Luke 10, 25-28. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. There you go. As long as you love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your, your strength, and as long as every second of every day from cradle to grave, you love your neighbor, you're all set. You have nothing to fear from death. Now the problem is, when Jesus says, love God and your neighbor and you will live... He is actually doing this. He is summing up the Ten Commandments into that phrase. He's really saying this. Do not break any of the Ten Commandments and you will live. You will go to heaven. Do not break one. I am the Lord your God is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. So as long as every moment, every breath, every waking minute, you have had no other gods before the true God, you're all set. You shall not make idols, number two. I probably blew the first two in the first, I don't know, two years of life. Probably one of my first words were mine. Me, 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 me. I, I made an idol right there. Two-year-old idol walking around. Mine, mine. <laughs> Number three, do not use the Lord's name wrongly. Ouch. Let's move on. Uh, Number four, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So there you go. Keep the first four commandments... And you will be doing your part on loving God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength, and you will be all set and on the road to being all set, actually. You aren't there yet. Now's the next one. Honor your father and mother. I had what you called lip. I gave some lip quite often. That's not honoring my mother or my father. If my mother really were sitting over there, she'd probably tell you he still gives lip. <laughs> Do not murder. Well, that's easy. I haven't killed anyone yet. Remember, Jesus calls anger and hate murder of the heart. Do not commit adultery. Well, let's not forget that Jesus said anybody that looks with lustful thoughts has already committed adultery in their heart. Do not steal. I've never stolen a thing in my life, people say all the time. And I think all I've done is stole. I suppose that do not steal means no downloading of songs for free anymore. No plagiarizing the words of others. No taking... This one gets me. No taking napkins from fast food restaurants <laughs> to stock up the glove box in my car. You know what? I was writing this yesterday, and man, did I feel God's hand of conviction. <laughs> Honey, put it on the grocery list to buy some napkins for my car. Number nine, do not bear false witness. Don't lie, in other words. Number ten, do not covet. Do not want anything that your neighbor has. Every time I go into our parking garage, I see some really nice Beamers and a Ferrari. And a Ferrari, and that Ferrari is red. And I'm thinking, why are you living in an apartment building? They're trying to pay for the Ferrari. <laughs> Beautiful. And I just have to say, thou shalt not covet. So there you go. In addition to loving God by keeping the first four commandments, all you have to do your entire life is keep the next six because that will demonstrate that you also love your neighbor as yourself. 
That's what Jesus is saying. Do all of these things perfectly and you will live. And you notice I said perfectly because Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, 48, you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And James reminds us, James 2.10, the person who keeps all of the laws except for one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. Well, he knows what my heart is. Okay, I haven't kept all of his laws, but he knows my heart. That's not a good thing, folks. <laughs> That's not a good thing. I'll ask for volunteers in a few minutes. I'll ask for volunteers. I got a new machine out back. We'll bring it in here and it will reveal every thought that you have had in your heart and in your mind over the past six months and especially about the pastor and everybody around you. And it'll just project them up on the wall. It'll project them all up on the wall. I'm going to ask for volunteers. Do you want everything you have thought, everything in your heart revealed to those around you? I don't. Not at all. Not even what I'm thinking right now. God does know our hearts. When he looks at our hearts, he sees a heart that is filled with every inclination of evil from childhood. Genesis 8.21. And he sees a heart that is deceitful about, above all else and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9. According to reality, not our thinking, but the truth of God's word, upon death... There is no taking the fifth, no pleading ignorance. There are no do-overs, no, no second chances, no mulligans. And there is none who can rightly say, I have kept all ten commandments perfectly my entire life, so therefore I am all set. The fool considers death to be the moment their body stops working. The Darwinist is a fool. If he considers death to be the moment that their body stops working and that is all she wrote, he's a fool. The ignorant consider death to be the moment that their body stops working and their spirit moves on to where they do not know. The self-righteous man considers death to be the moment that their body stops working and their spirit goes to heaven because of their own goodness. But according to the Bible, death is none of these. The Bible describes something different. The Bible describes death as the moment that our body does stop working, our physical body, at which time we immediately stand before God in judgment. And then based upon that judgment, either life in heaven follows, if we have perfectly kept every one of those Ten Commandments or if somebody has stood in our place and for those who have not kept the Ten Commandments and do not have an advocate standing in their place to vouch for them and there's more on that in a minute then that judgment is followed by what the Bible calls death, the second death. Also known as the lake of fire, hell, Hades, and eternal suffering. If you're a person who plans on pleading ignorance or hopes you'll be given a mulligan or thinks you're all set, you should be feeling pretty uncomfortable right now. Knowing God's standard for goodness is perfection from cradle to grave and nothing less. On the other hand, if you're a person who knows that when you die, there will be no pleading ignorance, that there will be no second chances, and if knowing that really does concern you because you know that your heart is wicked and your deeds are evil, <laughs> then listen up because you do not have to fear death any longer. Neither death one or death two because today we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. The day that he defeated death on behalf of those who will put their faith and hope and trust in him. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. It gives us some great news. 
Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. This is what it says there. Therefore, talking about Christ theref- and, and about us. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood. So since we all share in flesh and blood. He, Jesus himself, likewise also partook the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Every one of us in this room before Christ lives in fear of death. We may not admit it. But we, we do everything in our lives because we're afraid of death. We'll go to doctors, we'll take vitamins, we'll do all these crazy things trying to prolong, prolong our life because we actually have an internal fear of death before we know Christ. But Christ died himself and rose from the dead so that the power of death might be overcome. The resurrection of Jesus means there are some who do not have to live in fear of being caught dead in their sins. Who don't have to live in fear about what they're going to say to the judge to try to convince them. Who do not have to go through their life with one mirror, one eye in the mirror looking behind, afraid that death is going to sneak up on them before they have done enough good deeds to outweigh the bad ones. The resurrection of Jesus is good news. Because death... Jesus has defeated death. He has rendered death powerless. At moments like this, I'm always thinking of that. What you talking about, Willis? Remember that? (laughs) What you talking about, Pastor? People die all the time. Even Christians die. What do you mean Jesus defeated death? (coughs) We're not talking about something as minute and as petty as earthly death here. Because the Bible often refers to our earthly death as just sleep. We're talking about Jesus defeating the second death. And that those who are in Christ have no fear of hell or the second death. They need not. And the fact that Jesus defeated the second death itself would be nothing even for us to celebrate if the story just stopped there. If the story stopped at the resurrection, I'll tell you what, folks, I wouldn't be celebrating. What do you mean by that? Well, if Jesus rose from the dead and his resurrection didn't affect me in any way, uh, then I wouldn't be celebrating his resurrection. So what? But the good news is, the great news is, that the resurrection is not the end of the story either. Jesus defeated death for a reason. And we're told that reason. In 1 Corinthians 15.20, we're told the reason why the resurrection of Christ is really good news and great news, fantastic news for us. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, for those who have repented of their sins and put their faith in Christ alone, for those who are no longer trusting in their own good works to save them, the Bible refers to the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the resurrection of the first fruit of the harvest. The first fruit of the harvest. A harvest that Jesus begins of resurrected saints of God, that, that that harvest continues and it is comprised of those who in their belief in Christ will themselves be resurrected with Christ one day, just as Jesus was. That's the great news. The resurrection of Jesus, good news. Great news is one day each and every person who puts their faith in Christ, who is born again, will be raised with him. He is just the first fruit. He's just the promise of what is coming to us. Have you been born again? That you may be part of that harvest. Have you repented of your sin and turned to Jesus for salvation so that he will be a first fruit for you? 
I mean, have you actually stopped trusting in your own supposed goodness to get you into heaven? Trusting instead now in the fact that Jesus perfectly kept the law on your behalf and that he was punished for your sin in your place? If you have repented and believed upon Jesus Christ, and if you are trusting in his deeds, not yours, to get you to heaven, then rejoice and be glad. This morning we're going to end this message with words that are very encouraging to those who are in Christ, to those who have been born again, to those who have placed their faith in Christ alone for salvation. These words are just so encouraging. And in our bulletin I put in homework for people if they want. Go home and read 1 Corinthians 15 and just reflect upon it this week. The whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. But I'm going to focus towards the end of that chapter. Um, and I'm going to read the verses starting from around verse 42 as an encouragement to those who have put their faith in Christ. Um, Paul writes this, Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a living spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power, but thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Those are really encouraging words to end this message on, to end our service today on. They are very encouraging words. I mean, words that remind us that although our life in this world will only one day end, our life in Christ will last forever if we are found in him. Have you ceased trusting in your goodness to save you? Have you repented and believed upon Jesus for salvation? Then rejoice and be glad. Leave here today blessed by the promise of resurrection for you found in the resurrection of your Lord Jesus Christ. And to those who claim ignorance or look for a second chance or a hope that their good works are good enough, on this resurrection day, there's also a promise for you. If you will repent and believe upon Jesus, you too no longer will have to fear death yourself. For in Christ, death will have lost its victory over you as well. As the worship team comes up to lead us and end us in one song, let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for Jesus. We are thankful that he came, he died in our place. We are thankful, Father, that if we put our trust in him and if we believe upon him, that we will be saved and that we will share and that death for us will be defeated. Yes, we may die in this world, Lord, if you do not come again, but that is only but sleep. Sleep for a moment and we will have a life eternal in Christ. And Father God, we are so thankful for that, that you 
Lord Jesus became for us the sacrifice and the offering that our sins could justly be forgiven. And we give you all the glory. Father, I pray for all of those in this place that today we will all go forth knowing the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and find hope in that, we pray. As we end our service in song, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.